Oi, 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 everyone, and welcome back to another video on the channel. I hope that you've unclenched your jaw and that you're feeling great today. Maybe get some sunshine, get some water. Here in a little bit, for now at least, we're going to be discussing how to play my favorite killer in Dead by Daylight, the Executioner. So let's go ahead and uh, first just dive into how he functions and how his powers work so we can better understand implementation later on in the video. The Executioner, aka Pyramid Head, is a 115% movement speed killer with a standard 32 meter terror radius. He comes kitted with two particularly special abilities. The first ability is his Rites of Judgment. With his great knife, Pyramid Head will drag his blade through the ground, splitting the very floor and leaving a trail. To do so, you'll just hold your ability button. Your movement speed does dip a little and is lower to 92% during the one second wind up to the rights and the subsequent release of the rights. When using the rights and charging your blade in the ground, you move at 110% movement speed. When also charging the rights, your turn speed is drastically reduced and it becomes slower than the turn speed of a survivor. Now, any survivor who does step in the Rites of Judgment will be afflicted with the Torment status effect. This status effect appears as barbed wire across the survivor's screen and player icon, and spools of barbed wire will follow their every movement. If a survivor is downed while carrying the Torment status effect, Pyramid Head can send the survivor to a Cage of Atonement instead of picking them up and hooking them. The cage will spawn generally on the opposite side of the map from where Pyramid Head is but the specific location will only be revealed to survivors. It is worth noting that cages do not count as hooks with regards to hook perks. So barbecue and chili, pop goes the weasel, furtive chase, dying light, etc. Perks that are activated based on hooks will not activate if you cage a survivor. Now this goes the same for survivor players. Borrow time, decisive strike, will make it, etc. will not activate when the survivor is uncaged. Now, the only way to remove the torment status effect as a survivor is to either be put into a cage and to be uncaged or to be somebody who uncages somebody else. And of course, if Pyramid Head downs somebody and they are on death hook instead of caging, he will use his mini Mori, the final judgment. Again, survivors do need to have the torment status effect for this to work. Pyramid Head's final ability is called Punishment of the Damned. This ability builds on to the rights of judgment. While holding your rights of judgment in the ground, hit your basic attack button to send a wave attack at your target. This attack can hit through pallets, windows, and even walls, but cannot travel over holes in the floor or go up hills or stairs. It can travel down stairs and hills in some specific cases. It does have a range of about eight meters, and knowing this range is very important. Now, let's go ahead and deep dive into the abilities and all of the applications, all of the most common case uses, etc. And we're just going to go ahead and d dive into the uh, rights of judgment, okay? Uh, first and foremost, let me go ahead and say that you cannot place the rights of judgment trail near hooks or generators. The trail will despawn a few seconds after being placed if it is too close to these objects. So, for those of you hoping to proxy camp or afflict your status effect via trapped gens, you simply can't do this. Now, when dragging your rights of judgment, you will see this bar in the bottom left hand corner start to deplete all right after five seconds of dragging the rights of judgment the bar will go from full to completely empty and firing the punishment of the damned ability takes 20 percent of this meter down so if you're completely full you put your blade in you fire you've lost one second of drag time 20 percent of the bar However, you can fire the punishment of the damned even if there's just a tiny bit of the bar left without any well, punishment. Uh, and lastly, if you're standing still, Rites of Judgment does not drain this bar. And this applies if you're falling from, a, a, you know, a building or something like that as well. It does not drain. Now, the wiki says that you can place a hundred trail elements on a map at any given point in time before the newest replaces the oldest. Uh, what I will say is that it takes about 75 seconds for a trail to fully despawn. And it takes about 20 seconds for the Rites of Judgment ability to fully recharge back. I was able to place three entire full trails in the ground, three full Rites of Judgment trails in the ground uh, before anything started despawning. And at that point, we were reaching our 75 second mark and the first one started despawning. So food for thought, these things only last on a map for about 75 seconds ish. 
Now, you could place rights of judgment in front of windows or pallets to trap them preemptively. If you wanted to walk up to the shack and place the trail down at a window so that it's locked for later, you could do that. But again, because the trail disappears after 75 seconds, trying to use them in this way can be a huge waste of time. It doesn't really make any sense. It's not very efficient, okay? It is worth noting, however, that if you suspect a survivor is in a locker, you could place the trail in front of the locker. A survivor emerging from the locker will be tormented. And do keep in mind that survivors can crouch walk through the rights of judgment trail without taking the torment status effect. When it comes to consistently using the rights of judgment and afflicting it, lots of people do tell me that they cannot get survivors to step into the trail. Uh, this can be alleviated by looping with the rights of judgment, and I'll kind of show you what I mean. Let me be specific here. If a survivor is in a loopable area, so areas with pallets or windows like LT walls, shack, jungle gyms, or even short pallet loops, you should place your blade in the ground and you can loop with your rights of judgment in the ground, okay? This forces a survivor to choose. Do I stay in the loop? and step through the trail, or do I just leave the loop entirely and move to a more unsafe part of the map? By doing this, you'll apply the torment status effect in a good majority of your chases, or you'll get extremely easy chases where survivors just dodge strong loops. If survivors aren't looping and are just holding W or early throwing all of their pallets, which you'll see this at like lower rank survivor matches, you can't necessarily force them to step into the trail. In a weird way, it requires that survivors challenge you at loops and feel confident for the rights to be consistent and applicable. It is also entirely worth noting that if a survivor steps into the Rites of Judgment trail, they will proc the Killer Instinct, which will highlight and show you sort of a, a visual indicator and a heartbeat to go along with it to indicate that somebody now has the Torment status effect or has reapplied it. But next up, let's go ahead and dive into how to use the Punishment of the Damned, all right? Now, Punishment of the Damned is a powerful attack that you're gonna wanna use more often than your M1, for a few reasons. Punishment of the Damned can hit multiple people at once. In many cases, if a survivor like unhooks right in front of you, you can wait for the full unhook animation to be done before you fire your shot, and if done correctly, both parties will take damage. And this is the same for people that are healing and things of that nature. It's also important to note that Punishment of the Damned has a 2.25 second cooldown on the attack, which is much faster than the three second cooldown of an M1. So in some cases, if you could M1 a survivor at a window, why not use your punishment of the damned attack? Being able to use your punishment in this way is gonna help you to not lose, you know, three or four extra meters of distance as a survivor runs away or whatever. So it's really important just to keep that in mind. Uh, use your ability whenever you can. When using the punishment of the damned or, or when having the rights of judgment charged, the attack forecasts its projected path by illuminating the floor. This illumination exists for about 0.26 seconds before the attack actually begins and rolls out. After this delay, the attack rolls out in sort of an 8 meter wave. It is important to understand that the attack does roll out in a wave though. Conceptually understand this. This means you have to account for distance when taking the shot. A survivor who is 2 meters away from Pyramid Head has less time to observe, react, and dodge the attack than a survivor who's like at the 7 or 8 meter range, okay? Additionally, unlike a Huntress Hatchet or something like that that's a projectile, because this is a wave, a survivor who's close to you could dodge the attack only to fishtail back into it in one of its later segments, so keep all of that in mind. Now, when it comes to usage of Punishment of the Damned, there are some pretty serious do's and don'ts and things to understand. When Pyramid Head is dragging the Rites of Judgment, his turn speed is extremely limited, okay? So much so that survivors are faster at turning than he is. And as we mentioned, the floor illuminates when launching the attack, giving an indicator to survivors so they know when to dodge. This is very much unlike killers like Nemesis or Huntress, who can turn faster than survivors, giving them the ability to flick their shots kind of at a close range, regardless of survivor movement. Pyramid Head doesn't get the same benefit of a fast flick, okay? In this way, Pyramid Head's attack isn't incredibly effective out just in the open when you're between loops or something of that nature. Of course, if a survivor isn't turning their head or turning around, if they're not watching the killer or they're not fishtailing to try to be unpredictable, you can hit shots out in the open, but be aware of the risk involved here and the likelihood of missing, okay? Be very uh, observative of survivor behavior and movement before just taking it out in the open shot, okay? 
Now, when it comes to getting hits with Pyramid Head, his punishment can go through walls, through pallets, through windows, etc. Sort of as we talked about before. At its most basic, you can use the attack to hit survivors who are locked into pallet throw animations, vault animations, etc. Undoubtedly, this is something that still takes lots of map knowledge, understanding of survivor path, and great observation skills, and decent knowledge with regards to the angles of which you're shooting, okay? Uh, as you approach a tile or loop, you'll need to know the layout and have your blade in the ground ahead of time, all right? Uh, if you don't have your blade ready in time, you'll end up putting your blade in the ground too late and taking a shot that misses because the survivor went ahead through the pallet and already got out of the way, okay? It is important that you know what's coming up when you're approaching a tile, all right? When using Pyramid Head in this way, you'll also definitely need to be incredibly patient and wait and observe the animation locks happening, okay? Because while you'll undoubtedly hit a lot of survivors while they're in animation locks, there's also a large counterplay here for survivors. If a survivor is paying attention, they'll run at a window or at a pallet, and they'll make you think that they're about to use this obstacle, right? As you go to take the preemptive shot, the survivor simply will dodge left or right at the last minute, making distance on you while you take a shot that leaves you in a vulnerable state that connects with nobody, all right? So be very sure that the survivor is in animation before you fire. Now, if the survivor attempts to dodge, right? You have your blade in the ground, you're walking towards the window or pallet, and they suddenly move to the left or right. You do have some options, okay? Uh, obviously, you don't wanna fire here. You can continue to hold your rights of judgment, Often when the survivors realize that they didn't fake you out, make you miss, they'll go back to the window or go back to the pallet to try to, you know, stun you, make distance, etc. And then you can shoot through those obstacles. However, if the survivor puts themselves in a compromising situation by trying to bait out your shot, you can pull your rights out of the ground and just M1 the survivor, just do the basic attack, okay? Now keep in mind that pulling your blade out of the ground does take one second and does slow you down to 92% movement speed. So be very aware of any, you know, slowdown you're gonna take there when trying to figure out if you're gonna pull your blade out in M1 or not, all right? Now, with regards to animation lock shots, I don't always break every single pallet. Uh, if there's an unsafe loop, like a few rocks with a pallet in between or something like that, sometimes even a jungle gym, I don't break pallets immediately in some cases. Like if I hit somebody or I get a shot on somebody who is about to throw the pallet or who throws the pallet, they usually take their speed boost and they leave the loop entirely. Uh, and so if they leave the loop, I just walk around the pallet. I just leave it down until I can come back to it and break it, right? Um, in this way, if played correctly, I remember that the pallet is down and I can catch a survivor at an animation lock that they otherwise wouldn't have been at. So sometimes leaving a pallet down can actually benefit you as somebody vaults it. Uh, so do be careful doing this though. You don't wanna trip yourself up. If you're missing your shots a lot, then survivors are gonna take advantage of a down pallet. So you gotta be sure that you're up to snuff, right? All of that being said, that'll kind of segue us into the next micro tip for the animation locks, but this will scale up to almost every other tip that we're gonna talk about with regards to punishment, and that is hooking pyramid head. And what I mean by this is a lot of times you're going to be chasing a survivor who rounds the corner of an obstacle and immediately like vaults a pallet or immediately vaults a window. A good example is this Claudette who loops the outside of shack only to medium vault into the window. And we sort of hook pyramid head into the wall. And this is like a really small form of this, but you're gonna see this a lot when you're chasing somebody and a pallet is down. You know, the outside of a loop, a pallet's down and then they vault the pallet and you can still get the hit. The idea here is to 100% know where obstacles are in relation to yourself. Remember where down pallets are, remember where windows are coming up and be prepped to hook really tightly, hook pyramid head into a wall and hit the right angles. You don't want an angle that is too deep, right? And what I mean by this is an angle that goes directly into the obstacle and completely misses the pallet, for instance. You don't also want a shot that's too shallow because shallow shots may not even connect at all. They, you know, There's almost no hope of them connecting if it doesn't actually make it through the obstacle that you're, you're aiming at. So keep the angles in mind. You will wanna take like a 30 to 45-ish degree angle, really depending on where you are, where the survivor is. But the idea is to cover, like if this is the front of the pallet, you wanna cover just a huge strip going diagonally from smallest to fattest so that survivors have really no way to dodge this shot. The angle here is really important and you're gonna get a lot of these these weird angles, like I said, when you hook Pyramid Head into obstacles um, and turn him tightly into an obstacle to get a hit on somebody medium vaulting or fast vaulting a pallet that you left down. 
Now, the second way to use Pyramid Head's Punishment of the Damned is at a short loop or pallet loops, okay? These are areas on any map where there's some debris, a car, and a pallet, right? Something of that nature that isn't particularly strong. It could be safe, who knows, all right? As we discussed earlier, you should be looping these areas with your rights of judgment in the ground. Not only does this force the survivor to step into the trail or leave, but it also generates pressure. Because of the predictability of Pyramid Head and his lack of a flick, the best way to generate pressure is to hold the rights while chasing. This keeps survivors sort of on their toes, if you will, wondering when or if the shot's even going to happen. As you drag your trail behind the survivor, the best time that I find to shoot is when the survivor rounds a corner, typically the shortest end of the loop. A good example is here at this car on Haddonfield. As I loop the survivor around, I take a diagonal shot through the short end of the loop. This distance requires that you aim a bit ahead of the survivor to allow for the slight attack delay due to the wave, but it is learnable and it's probably one of the strongest things in his toolkit, especially in purple ranks and things like that. Another great example is here with this Dwight where I'm dragging the rights of judgment behind him and as he rotates around the side of the loop here, I shoot through the loop right at the rounded corner. Uh, this puts him incredibly close to me. The obstacle here is only like a meter wide at best, giving him almost no time for a reaction. He would have had to have guessed and dodged and he did not. Same as before though, uh, the counterplay here for survivors is to keep their eyes on you and to double back when you fire. If executed correctly, your shot will launch ahead of them. They will continue the loop and early throw the pallet, vault a window, make distance, etc. The counterplay to their attempts at dodging or the counterplay to their counterplay is uh, it's about the same as before. If a survivor doubles back expecting a shot or something of that nature, obviously pay attention to the survivors that are smart and if they're doing this a lot, you could take advantage of that because if they double back, you can keep your trail in the ground, see what they do next, potentially take a shot at them, or you could just pressure them and M1. Again, survivors are going to put themselves incredibly out of position to try to double back or to try to juke your shot and you can take advantage of this just by hitting the M1 attack. Don't overcomplicate it and also, like I said, look for a pattern of behavior. Is the survivor doing this repetitiously or not? So another piece of counterplay that works both here and at some windows and things like that, short loops, is to sort of fake the shot, which is kind of weird, and I'll explain what I mean. So if you're tracking the survivor, right, they're running a direction, you're tracking them that same direction, right, and you suspect that they're gonna double back if they're looking at you, paying attention, you might think they're going to double back. Instead of firing ahead of them, you'll want to track in front of them and then fire behind them, right? So track ahead of them and then quickly move to be behind them and fire. And what this kind of does is survivors expect you to take a shot ahead of them. So they preemptively double back. And what you want them to do is double back into the shot. So if you've seen throughout the match that they double back, that they pay a lot of attention, it may benefit you to track ahead of them and then last minute flick and then try to shoot behind them, right? So you're trying to catch them off guard. This one can be kind of tough to pull off and is super worth honing in on, but just be sure that you're not falling into the trap of just shooting over and over and over. If you've taken like two shots as Pyramid Head and they're not connecting, you may need to move on to faking them out into an M1 or something like what we've talked about previously. Don't uh, overuse this. If you're missing a lot, then just go ahead and move on and practice it in, a, in the next chase or something of that nature. As you graduate or, or just get better at the regular sort of pallet loop type shots, you're gonna graduate into the corner shots. And these are, I think, the bread and butter. You'll learn these a lot, especially in purple ranks. You'll get tons of hits, even in red ranks sometimes. These are intended, of course, to down survivors before they can get to a safe pallet or to hit a survivor who is healthy, make them injured and scare them away from a strong tile, okay? So when chasing a survivor near a wall of a decent size or length, you want to put your blade in the ground and you know your rights of judgment and start following said survivor. As the survivor disappears and rounds the corner, uh, you'll want to mentally sort of track the survivor through the wall based on where and how you think they'll run the loop, and then you'll want to take your shot. If performed appropriately, you'll hit the survivor through the wall without even having seen them. Now, again, this is where you'll start practicing tracking survivors without actually seeing them, which requires you mentally gain a feel for how fast they're moving when they're running so that you can appropriately aim, okay? Your distance here is also incredibly important, all right? Uh, because you can't see them, 
you really aren't quite 100% sure why you missed the shot. And this is going to be really important. We'll talk about this a little bit later. But if you're too far away, the shot may not go far enough through the obstacles to connect, all right? You do need to be close enough to land the hit. I usually recommend being within like four meters at the furthest, um, but practicing will definitely help you get a feel for it when you're doing the corner shots, all right? And as you pay attention to how close you are and start learning to track survivors, you'll learn how important the uh, angle is. And this is where some potentially controversial advice comes in. I personally got much better at Pyramid Head by playing a little bit of Nurse, specifically when blinking through loops like Jungle Gems, etc. The prediction and having to track a survivor on the shorter blinks when you cannot actually see them can help you a tiny bit. And from a nurse perspective, it's a little bit more forgiving because you'll blink through a wall and you can take a look around and see where the survivor moved, what they did, where they went. And you can kind of carry that into playing Pyramid Head where you kind of start to understand the pathing a little bit more, how they're moving, where they're going, how fast they're moving. And so, you know, a eh, little giga brain. Maybe it's good, maybe it's not. Uh, if you don't like nurse, that's okay, but I highly recommend trying it, okay? Of course, uh, the application of Nurse to Pyramid Head isn't one-to-one, -one, but like I said, it did genuinely help me. Now, as the same before, the counterplay to corner shots is a simple double back. A survivor can disappear on the wall and then double back real fast, back into your line of sight, making you take a shot, miss, and allow them to get distance, etc. Okay. Uh, countering this uh, is again the same as before. If you notice the survivor repetitiously doing this, instead of taking the shot, just go for the M1. You might be able to take a shot if they double back and commit to running the loop again or something like that, but this happens way less often. Now there is another counter to the corner shot and that is simply running the loop really wide as a survivor. If a survivor runs a loop wide by a few meters to avoid this shot, most pyramid head shots through corners just, they, they won't actually reach most of the time, or the angles will be completely off. In the event that survivors are running all of your loops wide, you'll need to pay attention as to why you're missing. Generally, if you fire a shot and around a corner after knowing it didn't hit, you'll see the survivor sort of oddly out of position in a lot of cases. Uh, this indicates that to evade the shot, they ran wide. The next time running a similar loop with this survivor, you'll prep a corner shot, but not actually take the shot. As you round the corner, you'll see the survivor out of position. You'll be gaining distance by the second. Here, again, you can choose to shoot or use an M1. And if they recommit to the loop, shooting may work. Otherwise, you run the risk of missing the shot. So in this particular case, if you know they're running wide, take advantage of the fact that they're gonna lose distance by running wide and don't shoot, fake them out. And after enough corner shots, you'll be ready to graduate. Using all of the knowledge you've gathered, you'll be ready to take blind shots through walls. Typically this works at tiles like shack, um, but can also work in some main buildings and things like that. Being able to land these shots will absolutely make your chases much faster and scare survivors into leaving what would be a safe loop. The principles are the same as corner shots, the same as everything else that you have learned. They're just slightly less visually informed. As a survivor disappears behind a structure, like into the shack, for instance, you want to have your sword in the ground and start tracking where they would have gone. Uh, if they entered shack, they more than likely are running through to the next door or to the window. You'll likely track sideways here, predicting movement and speed and take your shot. To help your shots land, you may want to start considering your angle as well, okay? A shot that enters, for instance, straight through the shack window is more likely to be dodged by a survivor just by them juking side to side. However, a shot that is angled from a corner, this corner, for example, is a lot harder to dodge. A simple back and forth from survivors may not be enough and actually may keep them in the line of fire. This also has a lot to do with where survivors expect you to shoot from and things of this nature, but is completely worth considering when you take your shots, okay? That is also what makes blind shots so powerful. The survivor at short loops can see where Pyramid Head is aiming simply by looking at him. Where he's facing is the aim, but behind walls there's anonymity on both sides. Taking obtuse angles that cover potential dodges can make this so much more potent and again, try to think about where the survivor is trying to go. What's their goal? Where are they moving to? 
Of course, juking here for survivors is possible if they can predict or react within the 0.26 second mark. In this way, be very mindful of your distance, right? Leaving them less time to dodge. It is a wave attack. So somebody at the seven meter mark has a little bit more time to dodge than somebody at the two meter mark, for instance, okay? In certain scenarios, be sure that you watch a survivor's feet as well to know if they're going to stick to running a loop or not, okay? A good example is right here. This Meg doesn't turn immediately to the right or she doesn't hang the corner very tightly. She actually kind of looks like she's just running super wide or making distance. So in this specific scenario, I don't put my blade in the ground or anticipate shooting through the shack wall because it looks like she's just sort of leaving. Be very observative here or you can end up looping yourself almost. And during any of these chases with your blade in the ground, survivors may run past or through pallets to fake throws and deceive you into taking shots that you aren't gonna hit. In the event that this happens, you wanna be sure you body block the survivor from getting back to the pallet. You'll do this far more often than you expect to. A good example is this Kate who thinks I'll shoot into the pallet diagonally, almost a corner shot. So she dodges outward and instead I don't take the shot. I keep dragging my blade and I put myself in front of the pallet so she can't reach it. Get the simple M1 attack. In all of these shot types though, you do wanna keep in mind that incredibly smart survivors can dodge so many shots against Pyramid Head. He can't really flick that well, but his blade even being in the ground is what gives him potency. The guessing game of what happens next Simply having your blade in the ground causes mistakes that you could capitalize on. It causes them to guess. And if you're practiced enough, survivors who choose to stick to loops get punished as well. It can almost become a lose-lose scenario for survivors if you're patient and observative. If they throw the pallet, they take the hit. If they don't throw it, they get the M1. If you continue to do this and not just operate off of assumptions, but operate off of observation and patterns, you'll be a great pyramid head, okay? Now quickly, I'd like to discuss some sort of unique angles and hits that you can make with Pyramid Head that I've discovered over uh, my period of time playing him. On any Azeroth map, if a survivor runs up into the excavator, this machine here, and they vault the window, you can actually hit them in two ways. You can vault through the floor as you walk up the stairs. It's at a very slight angle. If you're too low, it won't work, but you could shoot through this wall here as they're vaulting, it will absolutely hit them, okay? or you can shoot through these tires as they land out the window. And there's actually, if you just wait to listen for the vault, you can fire right after they, the vault sound happens and they'll fall and they'll land right into it. So really solid way to hit. This is a strong loop of survivors just want to run circles around it. And uh, this is really hard to dodge. So if you get really good at this, they're gonna have a hard time dodging this entirely, all right? You can hit survivors at any second story window as long as they're mid animation. So this applies to Haddonfield, Temple of Purgation, Mother's Dwelling, any second story window. If they're mid animation, you can hit them. Doesn't matter if they're on the second story, all right? If survivors step out onto this awning in Haddonfield, uh, they can actually get hit through the wall here because there is the roof. So they can get hit here as well. You can also shoot through this top portion of the harvester, hitting someone who is going to vault uh, onto the hay bale. This might be a weird one, actually dragging your blade up the harvester kind of makes survivors think you're not gonna actually be able to hit them, but you can, absolutely. And as a small aside, if you are in the garage of a House of Pain, which is this structure on Haddonfield or Batham, if you're inside the garage, you can shoot through the house foundation to the outside or from the outside through the foundation into the garage. So not hyper applicable, but not uh, bad if you can make it happen. Now, lastly, I wanna talk about cages with Pyramid Head. There's not too much to talk about here, but there are some examples and some things that I think are completely worth thinking about when it comes to using the Cage of Atonement, all right? Cages generally, not always, but generally, will spawn in a corner completely opposite of where you are on the map. If you're in the left-hand corner near Thompson House, for instance, your cage will likely spawn near the shack in the far back corner, or it could spawn near Cowtree. Take this information into consideration when caging. If you've chased a survivor away from a three gen that you're protecting, you can cage them so that they're potentially sent closer to your three gen. That could generate some pressure for you and you could protect it a little bit better as well as protecting your gens. If you down somebody in your three gen, you could hook them instead of caging them so that you could protect the three gen better. 
Simultaneously, if you need a breather to let your 3-gen regress a little longer, you can cage the survivor, forcing a fellow teammate to run way out of the way to go get them and to heal, which allows you to further pressure any other survivors who are threatening other generators, things of that nature. If you have slugged multiple people, you could always cage one person and hook the next. This would allow you to hook someone near the middle of the map, perhaps, and have pressure while also forcing survivors to waste time to run way out and uncage in an obtuse part of the map. The idea here is just to know where survivors are and know how to waste their time, really. Hooking does inherently waste a bit of Pyramid Head's time when he could instead cage, but you have to consider the next step, what generates more pressure in the now and is better in the long term for the match. Hell, in theory, you could cage every person you down if you're downing them fast enough, forcing survivors to just run across the map repetitiously to waste time. Keep in mind, though, that with cages, survivors that get uncaged can't use D-Strike or Kindred or will make it or anything like that, right? So you could cage someone, down them after an uncage, hook them, and try to cage them again after they're unhooked. And this completely circumnavigates any D-Strike they may have. And be aware of your own perks, though, when doing this. When using perks like Devour, Hope, or Barbecue and Chili, caging won't grant you any token stacks. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't run these perks. We'll cover that all in a different video. It just means that caging requires more careful consideration. Also keep in mind with caging that a survivor who has the torment status effect can only remove this effect by uncaging somebody else or being uncaged themselves. If someone is tormented and for instance on death hook where you could use final judgment and they uncage somebody, well then they remove their status effect, meaning that you have to reapply it or hook them instead of using final judgment. And picking them up to hook them just leaves you open to flashlight save, sabos, wastes a little bit more time, etc. So if someone can be hit with final judgment on their next down, it may be worth not caging another individual until you can exact the final judgment so you don't lose any pressure, so you don't alleviate that uh, torment status effect. Now, additionally, it is worth noting that you can't really camp a cage of atonement if you as Pyramid Head are within five meters of a cage for 3.5 seconds, it will disappear into the ground and then it'll reappear elsewhere on the map, generally furthest from you. If the cage disappears, the progress of the survivor in the cage pauses for 10 seconds. All right, so in some specific scenarios, it could be worth it to send a cage elsewhere just to corner a survivor who's going for the uncage or something like that, but be very careful doing so. You don't want to accidentally buy survivors extra time. And additionally, survivors can see the auras of cages regardless of the blindness status effect if it's applied. So uh, running anything that creates the blindness effect doesn't make the cages uh, impossible to find or anything like that. Whew. I think that that covers at least the major sections of Pyramid Head and how to play him, how his abilities work, the best ways to use him, etc. Um, I spent a lot of time on this video. Of course, in this video, we didn't go over the best add-ons, the best perks and things of that nature, because I want to make a separate video on that one so that you guys can choose when you want to watch that, okay? I don't want you to sit through a one hour video. So we're, we're doing this one and we'll do the add-ons, the perks, everything in a, in a video coming up soon. Let me know down below if you, you want to hear that. Let me know your favorite Pyramid Head builds and I could tell you whether I think that they're decent builds for him or not. But let me know down below if there was also some stuff you didn't know, you didn't realize, or that you picked up, if this is going to help you. I, I'm really all about helping you guys to be better and to play better and to enjoy this killer because he is so much more complex and fun than people make him sound. So uh, thank you guys so much for being here. Please get some water. Uh, I'm going to get some water after 30 minutes of talking and I'll be praying to the entity to see you guys in the next videos.